What's up, everybody? You're watching NASA in Silicon Valley Live uh, for November 8th, 2018, and I am your host, Danielle Carmichael. And if you don't know, NASA in Silicon Valley Live is a conversational show out of NASA's Ames Research Center with all the various scientists, researchers, engineers, and all-around cool folks here at NASA, where we talk about all of the nerdy NASA news that you need to know about. And I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Abby. Hey. Hey, everybody. I am Abby Tabor. Thanks for joining us again. Welcome back this week. And I want to let everybody know where you can find us. So we are simultaneously live on Twitch, YouTube. YouTube and Facebook. Uh, but if you want to participate in the chat, you need to join us on Twitch. So that's twitch.tv slash NASA. But if you miss us live, don't worry. We'll be on video on demand after the show, including on NASA TV. And if you prefer the audio version, you can find us on your podcast service of choice. So let's do it. Shall we do it? Yeah. All right. So uh, did you know, Danielle, that today is National STEM Day? Yes, I did, and it's actually one of my favorite days of the year. You're a fan of STEM, are you not? I am. Yeah, well, for those of you at home who may not know about National STEM Day, it's a day that's meant to inspire kids and people of all ages, really, to explore their love of science and pursue their interests in science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM. So here at NASA, as you might imagine, we are huge fans of STEM. That's right. Uh, whether our researchers are sending humans to space, uh, developing new technologies to explore the solar system and beyond, or transforming the way we fly, uh, they have a shared passion for STEM. Absolutely. So for today's show, in celebration of National STEM Day, we're going to introduce you to some of the amazing wonder women of NASA who work here at Ames Research Center. They're all super huge fans of STEM, of course, and they're going to talk to us about what they do at NASA, how they got here, and a whole lot more. So I'm oh. ready. Let's get this Are show kicked off. All right, then. Um, before we go bring them in, I, I want to remind everybody, if you have a question, please leave it in the chat, and we'll try to get to those with each of our groups of researchers. So you want to invite our first guest now? Yeah, let's get started. So uh, let's go ahead and welcome our first guest, uh, Yasmin, Ali, and Laura. Come on out. Hey. hey. We have very tall chairs. <laughs> <laughs> You are not yeah. very tall yourself. I'm not very tall. <laughs> we'll give you a moment. Okay. <laughs> Get yourself settled. All right. Welcome, everybody. Well, thanks for having us. us. Thank Thank you. Exciting. Thank you. So, why don't we introduce you to everybody watching? Let's let's go down the line. If you could tell us your name and just really quickly, what do you do here at NASA? I'm Laura Arachi, and I'm an atmospheric chemist. So, I study the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, so my name is Ali Guarneros Luna, and I'm an aerospace and systems engineer, a rocket scientist. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Ah. Yeah. I'm Yasa Manchirazi. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer who's turned into a biologist. Uh, I'm a scientist in the Space Biosciences Research Division, and currently I'm the mission scientist for rodent research uh, for the Swiss Biology Program. Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, that is there. really cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so let's get things started. So tell me about yourself. Like, how did you know you wanted to, you know, work on rodents or, you know, work on payloads that flew, that fly to the, fly in space? Uh, well, it's a bit of a story. I've always had a knack for engineering since I was a little child. Uh, I always watched my dad fixing things around the house. I remember at age eight or nine or ten, I picked up a soldering iron and tried to fix a radio that we had. <laughs> soldering? So, so yeah, he came home with this, you know, horrified look, but uh. at the same time, he was, you know, proud that I was doing that. Right. And then I always had the space bug uh, growing up, so I always, you know, woke up in the middle of the night, watched all the shuttle launches and landing. Okay. Um, and uh, I grew up in Iran, uh, so at the time, there was no space program. There still isn't a space program in Iran. Uh, so for a long time, this was not something that I, I thought I could achieve. Um, I was fortunate enough that I uh, immigrated to the U.S. when I was 16, and uh, slowly I worked through all the challenges, and um, I'm here today. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. pretty cool. So, Inspiring. you know, I actually think we have a photo of oh, no. <laughs> Do we? <laughs> when you were young. So could we get that brought up? So oh, yeah. why this photo? So I do biomechanics. I do orthopedic biomechanics, uh, mainly bone biomechanics. And um, 
my grandma, this is a picture of my grandmother at my high school graduation in Connecticut. Um, so I got inspired and I got interested in bone biomechanics because I grew up watching my grandmother having a hard time walking, sitting down, going up the stairs. Mm -hmm. And then it was always something that we as a family had to keep in mind that, you know, where are we going? Is it close mm -hmm. enough to stairs? Where are we going to park and all that? Yeah. And then I think when I was 14, uh, there was a summer that my grandmother had a new replacement surgery. Okay. And uh, within days, she was able to walk. And I was with her in the hospital uh, during her physical therapy and all that. And um, it was just a miracle. You know, to me, it was, you know, for 14 years, I'd watch this person having a hard time walking. Yeah. And then every time the surgeons and the doctors would come in, I would always study those brochures on the <laughs> implants and all that, those <laughs> stuff that people throw away all the time. <laughs> right. uh, and then I was like, you know, whatever those people did in that room for those five, six hours, that's what I want to yeah. do. Yeah, life changing. Uh, that's, that's yeah, cool. so I got interested in bone mechanics. And, um, I started as a mechanical engineer. I, you know, did a lot of bioinstrumentation, biomedical engineering. And then when I was uh, picking programs for grad school, I was very specific on, on what I wanted to do. So um, I looked for the very specific program that was doing bone mechanics. Uh, and then it just happened that it was sponsored by the human research program at uh, NASA Johnson. Oh, so I got yeah. to do uh, orthopedic mechanics, looking at bone loss, recovery, countermeasures, in astronauts, uh -huh. uh, which was best of both worlds. It was a NASA project, but also uh, right. working on orthopedic mechanics. That is cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like that was your destiny. I, it was, I guess, <laughs> Maybe yeah. So. Yeah. 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 I love that that shows you don't have to know from the very beginning. You don't have to where, know. It's just all the very simple go, clues right? that you pick up. It doesn't have to be something big. It's just everything around you that you have to look at and get motivated and inspired by. Yeah. Very cool. It's yeah. pretty cool. Well, what about you, Ali? Like, what did what did you know you wanted to be an aerospace engineer or, as you like to say, a rocket scientist? Yes. Uh, that happens when I was, like, seven years old. Wow. Uh, I was very young. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I was – actually, I'm from Mexico, so when I was growing up in Mexico, my mother – used to buy encyclopedias. Okay. And I hope everyone knows what an encyclopedia <laughs> is because obviously times have changed, right? They were books. Yes. <laughs> and if you don't know, you can go to your local library. <laughs> the hard copy of Google search. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so they have cool pictures and things. And so when I will come from school, I will read them. And that was like my entertainment, right? Okay. And, um, and through one of those books, I saw a picture of the space shuttle. And you know, how I was going to transport humans into space, right? So I was captivated, and I I read about it, and then I read about the description of the person that it was actually building it, which was the aerospace engineer. Right. And I at that time, I was like, I want to do this job. I want to take, you know, <laughs> humans into space, build these cool machines. Mm -hmm. And so I, because of that, mm -hmm. I went to my family, and I said, I want to be an aerospace engineer. Amazing. And that everybody is. thought I was kind uh, of, uh, you know, where did I get that name from, you know? Right, because right, I never right. heard of it, right? Yeah. So now until I came to the United States and I was able to actually, you know, get that degree, go to school and, you know, be able to, you know, get my um, aerospace engineering degree. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise in Mexico it was like, you know, where did you get that that I degree see. from, right? I so see, it was yeah. it was not known. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're like we're here. So that's the opposite. Yeah. Oh, that's like what asking, right? You knew from age yeah. seven. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> So, but before oh. we move on, we also have a photo, we do. an origin yeah. photo. Can we go ahead and get that brought up on screen? Yeah. Oh, that's oh, oh, yes. Tell us what's happening there. Yeah, so these are the two last astronauts who flew the last space shuttle. Oh, wow. Oh. So for me, it was special because, you know, I actually... I, I was working with the astronauts at the time that they were uh, in space uh, with the SPHERES program. So okay. I was an engineer with the SPHERES program at that time. And so we had a 12-hour uh, mission ops. And then on my break, I went and uh, met these two last astronauts who flew the very last one. Wow, yeah. And so for me, it was like a culmination, right? Like a milestone. Like, I cannot believe I'm here, but yeah. So, yes. yes. Super cool. That's pretty cool. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, what about Laura? 
Well, how did, <laughs> when and how did you know you wanted to be what you are today? Well, in high school, I had two really great chemistry classes, and okay. we got to make stinky things, and we got to uh, <laughs> catch things on fire, yeah. and all sorts of really cool stuff. So that had me hooked pretty much uh, from 10th grade. Excellent. Um, so everything here, everything since then on is all the fault of my high school chemistry teacher, which is great. <laughs> and then when I was, you know, so I figured I'd go to college. That was kind of always the thing in our family. Get your keep increasing mm -hmm. your education. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, was looking for colleges. Found a college. Then after college, wanted to do something with chemistry, but a bachelor's in chemistry isn't really enough to to do chemistry research. So I was looking mm -hmm. around at the graduate programs, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what kind of chemistry I wanted to do. And I knew I wanted to do something that would help the planet. Yeah. You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. quite sure what that meant, whether that was going to be cleaning up Superfund sites or mm -hmm. what. But it's yeah, something pollution. something to make the world better, cleaner. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I was walking through the physics building at my college one day, and I saw a flyer for an internship program for that summer. And it was like two days till the deadline. <laughs> so it was, I think it was uh -oh. fate, right? Because it turns out, so I, I'm like, oh, I'll go work for NASA. That'd be fun. I, I won't get it anyway. Yeah, so I'll try. <laughs> I got selected, and I spent the summer at NASA Goddard. Okay. And hey, that was coasts. where I learned all about the ozone hole oh. and how there was concern that the space shuttle engine exhaust might also lead to ozone depletion and I got oh. to work for that guy who did that like wow. it was really cool and so then at the end of the summer I said okay what do I do next and he said well you got to go to graduate school and I said okay where and he said well I met this woman at a conference and she's you know she's teaching at this school and you should go there and so I went there and then after having had just 10 weeks of studying chemistry of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. I was pretty hooked. Okay. And I went and uh, spent, was it five years, I guess, getting the degree yeah. and then moving on from there. So it was right. in your destiny as well. I think it might have been. Yeah. And you know, and speaking of that, we have a photo. Yes, wait till you of, see. Of wait till you see what I looked like that summer. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Look at those curls. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah, I always wanted curly hair. My hair was a little too straight for the Farrah Fawcett era that I grew up in. Okay. So that was the summer I decided to give it a little chemical help. Very nice. Oh. Yeah. It was great. So, My it was great. Yeah. The summer of your perm and your yeah. life-changing NASA internship. Absolutely. <laughs> what a year. No, that's awesome. That is cool. So what does all of this mean for you today, right? Like, what what is a day in the life of Laura, the atmospheric chemist? Can you tell us what you do? Well, I don't catch anything on fire on a good oh, day. Yeah. Those no, are the bad boring. days, actually. <laughs> okay. um, so what I do get to do, though, is make measurements from aircraft that tell us about the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. So I work with a team. I lead a team of five or six of us who mm -hmm. um, calibrate instruments, put them on aircraft, and then analyze the data, and then give the data to folks who collect data by satellite. Oh, and okay. then they use our sort of ground truth data uh, to make sure that the satellites are returning the oh, right. proper okay. yeah. information. Comparing um, your data closer to home, right, with yeah, the satellite data? Exactly. See, yeah, exactly. So some of my days are spent counting satellite orbits to figure out when ah. they're going to be over oh. California at the right oh, time of day. Oh, okay. And some of my days are spent calibrating instruments and throwing wrenches, I mean, carefully tuning <laughs> all of everything with the wrenches. Um, right. So the, the days are all pretty different, actually, but they kind of go cool. on like a two-week cycle of preparing for a mission and then flying and then analyzing the oh, data. Yeah. So yeah. I hope some of those days you actually get to fly. Yeah, do you fly? Uh, I have twice um, mm. been up to collect data. Uh, and I've only thrown up once. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the um, landing back here at Moffett Field is kind of tough, actually, because the airspace is so congested with uh, SFO, the San Francisco mm -hmm. International Airport, and then San Jose Airport, and then there's a couple smaller airports, and so when the aircraft that we use for collecting data wants to get to Moffett Field, they have to come in through a really tiny sort of channel, and they make a really hard turn, and they Ooh. come down really fast. And kind of messed with me yeah. once, um, <laughs> but I didn't drop to the very end. Okay. okay. <laughs> Everyone appreciates that. Yeah. yeah. And I made it into the little barf bag. Okay. Oh, I was that's very nice. carefully positioned, so. Yeah. What's the name of your project or your plane or? So uh, the project is called Ajax. Okay. The Alpha Jet Atmospheric Experiment. Cool. Ooh, it's pretty cool. Nice and we met actually a couple members of her team, remember, we two weeks ago Last, on the Halloween yeah. episode. You did, you did. Caroline and Emma came in in their full flight suits that they have to wear at altitudes yeah. like that. It was pretty cool. It was, yeah, pretty cool. It was fun. It's a fun project. Very cool.
Um, so do we have? Did you have a photo you wanted to share of that? There is one of us out on the flight line, but whatever. Oh, makes, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So you can see the plane in the back there, and so this is three of us from the team deciding the last minute changes. You can see the the blue instrument cart there under the mm -hmm. wing, mm -hmm. and you can see the little um, GPS on the top of the cone there. So we're getting everything ready and synchronized. We get, need to synchronize all the instruments and get them all warmed up before flight. Cool. Um, and I'm guessing that at the point this picture was taken, I was probably cursing the weather, because if you look at the sky, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you'll see that the satellites were not going to see very much oh, that day. Cloudy, yeah. So I'm guessing I was probably trying to decide if we need to go to a different location, right? Okay. Instead okay. of going offshore, maybe we would be changing the plan to go into the Central Valley if it was clear there. Do you always okay. fly around California? Yeah, California and Nevada. We've got about a two-hour duration. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. Pretty cool. Interesting. All right, we better move on and learn about our other guests. <laughs> so, what's a day in the life of Ali? Um, it's um, very much like hers. You know, like I, I do different things. It's not mm -hmm. always the same. Very. Uh, yeah. Yes, very different. Um, it varies from day to day. It's never the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we build satellites, so small cubesats. Wait. Uh, you Speaking have of small yeah. sets, I actually have. Aha. Uh -huh. You brought one. One yes. for you. Thank you. Thank you. So, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> yes, everyone got one. one with the cube set. <laughs> so, they're very tiny, as you can see, right? This one is a uh, two, uh, one and a half U. That's what we call them. It's ten, they go by 10 centimeters. So, 10 centimeters is oh, something okay. like this. Okay. So, it will be one, one U. But this one is 15 centimeters. So, yeah. it's one and a half. And this is a satellite. It is a satellite. Actually, right. this it's is just a miniature. It's a, no, actually, this is the, satellite, the size. Yeah. Of this, of oh, satellite. yeah, that's what I meant. It's just okay. a tiny so, satellite. Yeah, yeah, so it's a tiny satellite. And uh, almost like a toy, right? So as you can imagine, it's almost like a watch that you have to build, uh, that it takes a lot of precision mm -hmm. and tries. And um, we start with the different instrumentations and then we build up, right? And as you can see, th this one right here is called the nodes. And uh, we flew it. We built it and flew it from uh, deployed from the space station in 2016 mm -hmm. and this is just one size we the one that i just finished it was a 6u but it was a long 6u okay and um it was 60 well actually it was 74 centimeters so it's more than 6u <laughs> Uh, and it had a lot of instruments the instrumentation we have like what NOAA radio we had a NOAA radio that is going to talk to the east and ghost uh Satellites. To the weather satellites. That's right. Oh, oh, okay. oh. New ones are great. Yes. And so, <laughs> yeah, and so NOAA tries to develop these radios, so they ask us to fly it. So we're flying it for them. Ah. And then we have a lunar radio, which is the first of its kind. Is um, If it works, we can actually talk from Earth to, this, to the moon distance Whoa. with no relay. Oh, so, which yeah. Is, yeah, which is something, you know, that a lot of people are interested because since we're going to the moon, we want to build that infrastructure. And then um, we also have um, Wi-Fi. So if you think of Wi-Fi, <laughs> we can Never actually... Never home without it. Yeah. I know. You can, we too. actually have it in our satellite and we can communicate from the satellite to the ground uh, and get video or data, right? Ah. We actually have a radio that you can use. So, right. uh, And then we also have wireless sensors. So oh. they're like little tiny wireless sensors and I think she has them right there. And I'm going to show so you. These yes. for you. Oh, wow. So this is how we started. I just want to show it to you guys. This is how we started the first wireless sensor. And this is what we ended up building a van. So these tiny ones are the ones that we put in our satellites, right? And so we can put them anywhere in, inside the satellite mm -hmm. and, this, and it will communicate to a coordinator. Oh, okay. And it will be able to give us data, whatever sensor we have in here. So we can have a a temperature, pressure, uh, mm. materials. Uh, we also have some of the satellites that I work, we have uh, TPS material at the bottom. Okay. So we can actually, if we want to, we can embed some instrumentation into the material and then learn how when it's burning, coming to reentry, oh. you know, it, it burns, right? Okay. And something that some we can Some protection know. down there to yeah. protect the instruments from burning up? No, no, no. That... We want to know how, how fast it's burning. Oh, how fast oh. it's burning. So we can characterize oh, okay. the, the material, right? Oh, and so right. that's what we use. And then this one right here, I brought it because this is actually the radio that we use oh. for the satellite. So we can actually communicate with the satellite via our computer's email. And we can uh, also use our phones. So we can actually wow. send command or receive commands from the satellite. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, that through is... these, you know, from the phone. So 
And that's that's you know just one. There's other stuff that I have. <laughs> we have a we have a uh, oh, we're gonna have VR <laughs> virtual reality uh, VR yeah on the satellite. Oh, so man. as it gets deployed, we can actually see. Oh cool. Uh, we we're filming the, sp the space station, and then we're getting the data. Uh, and it's actually compressing it on board. And then we, when we get it here, we actually put it together. And so we Ooh. giving the NVIDIA, you know, something interesting. So that's, you yeah. know, that's what it is. So, okay, but anyways. so a day in the life, you're building <laughs> yes. satellites. Building satellites, yeah. <laughs> and developing technology, That's yes. pretty amazing. Well, it looks mm -hmm. like Laura and Ali are pretty exciting. What about you guys, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what you got? What's the day in the life? She's so excited. I'm super excited, too. Yeah. Um, so... Again, as everyone else mentioned, it really depends what you're working on and what phase of the mission you're in. So okay. I wear two hats. One that I don't wear very often these days is my research hat. Hmm. Uh, my second hat that I wear all the time almost these days is uh, my mission scientist hat. Uh, so the International Space Station, ISS, was built uh, as a laboratory. It mm -hmm. took us over a decade to build it. But now it's at its full capacity and we're using it as a laboratory off the Earth. Uh, so that we can use the results that we get for the people who are on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, so I work with one of the few model organisms that are on the station. I work uh, with rodents. And then so we use rodents as uh, like a translational model because we can collect more data and then we can uh, do a very uh, detailed study uh, and then collect information that we couldn't collect on uh, people. Okay. But then we mm -hmm. use those results uh, to come up to study diseases or come up, come up with cures or countermeasures for people. Um, and then so basically my job is working with the scientists at uh, either NASA or um, universities, commercial entities, mm -hmm. uh, you know, industrial companies um, to take their science from the lab bench to their National Space Station. Now, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, that involves working with the scientists, scientists and then translating what they have for their science requirements, for engineers, for operations specialists, uh, train the crew members to do the science. I mean, okay. a lot of the crew members don't have mm -hmm. a science background, but um, you know, the overachiever people they are, you know, they'll <laughs> learn everything. Uh, so it's impressive how, you know, an Air Force pilot or a test pilot right. can work uh, with rodents or plants or cells that they've yeah. never done before. Uh, so, you know, once, once we do all that, then we're ready for flight, so we yeah. go down to Kennedy Space Center uh, to launch our payload on SpaceX Dragon, uh, and then we just wait for it, uh, hoping it launches. If it doesn't launch, then you know we go back to the drawing board, do everything all over again, and yeah. then the minute it launches, you want to you know take a deep breath because you're so <laughs> relieved. But then you have to remind yourself that this is just the beginning because yeah. now you have to do the whole mission on orbit right. so it's like and monitor it 24-7. Yeah. Well, not only you have to go to work, but now you have to go to work on GMT time because oh, the station is yeah. on GMT oh, time. That's so, right. uh, so yeah, a lot of times we come to work at 11 p.m. California time or 12 p.m. Yeah. California ah, time yeah. uh, so that we can work with the crew when they wake up. Yeah. Ah. So I have Adventure. a couple of things for you. So. Like what are what's this? Like can you yeah, explain so these to our are, audience? Uh, these are three D printed uh, bone models. Um, that so these these have been um, gained by uh, computer tomography. So uh, mm -hmm. CT, CT or like, like a clinical skills. CT. Yeah, yeah. So so the the micro CT that we use is uh, just like the clinical CT that uh, everyone uses, but at at a very smaller scale with a mm -hmm. higher resolution. Okay. Um, one of the uh, things that happens to humans as, as well as rodents in uh, microgravity is bone loss. So mm -hmm. being in microgravity is similar to accelerated aging. Oh, um, yeah. And so now, now we're we're working with uh, you know different groups to build an exercise machine to come up with countermeasures for our astronauts, and then we use uh, rodent models to study this because mm -hmm. rodents have a, a much shorter lifespan. Their lifespan is about two years. Um, and then the changes that happen uh, in their physiology, like musculoskeletal physiology, is very similar to the changes that okay. happens uh, in humans. Mm -hmm. So we use rodents, we send them to the ISS in microgravity so that the, the changes that happens in their, uh, let's say, muscles or bones in you know, a matter of 30 or 60 days is equivalent to you know, a couple of months or a couple of years in yeah. people. Yeah. Okay. And then so, so wait, we have, have to, to ask. Yes. Does that mean you've got a little tiny mouse treadmill? 
Oh. <laughs> because the picture in my head right now is adorable. <laughs> there are there are there are mouse treadmills here on the ground. We haven't flown one to ISS yet. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I have I have worked with treadmills or other exercise models. Actually, that's that's one of my expertise during my uh, graduate work, and then here my uh, postdoctoral work at NASA. Um, I worked on countermeasures uh, focusing on exercise, so treadmill running. Uh, Resistance training, aerobic versus you know mm. resistance. So cool. that's that's a lot that's of what cool. I've been working on, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> along with nutrition and uh, pharmaceuticals. But exercise is something that has proven to be beneficial for both rodents and humans. Mm -hmm. So ARED, the advanced resistance exercise device, is on orbit now. So all the crew have to work out about two to three hours oh, a day. Yeah, yeah, that's so much. Yeah, you can yeah. see photos Talk of about them. dedication. Yeah. Video. yeah. <laughs> so. I think we have, before we move on real quickly, we have an origin photo, or not an origin photo, a day in the life photo. A day in life photo, yes. yeah. So, so can yes. we get that so, up? So this is, this is the micro CT machine that I mentioned. Uh, so what you see there is a femur, but uh, this is basically where these scans are made. And uh, we create 3D models of the bones to quantify the changes that have happened. So we've got two types of bones. We've got the cortical bone, which is like the long tube black bone. And we have cancels or spongy bone, which is what I showed you. Okay. Um, and then all those little struts uh, are called trabeculi. So we look at uh, their structure, uh, their integrity, and whether they're broken or whether they're intact and how they change with space flight or exercise or diet or nutrition. Pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, shall we go on to our first should. segment? Because we have so much to talk about <laughs> and games to play, okay? Yay. So we're going to head into our Let's Play segment, okay? This may include game controllers, 12-sided dice, or popmatic bubbles. It's all an excuse to play games and talk about <laughs> science. Right? So let's get into that. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you what's going to happen here. We're calling this our Women at NASA quiz, and here's how it's going to work. We're, we'll put up an image on the monitor of an amazing NASA woman, and we're, we're going to give you clues about who that person might be. You try to identify them by name, and if anybody playing at home wants to get in on it, write your answer in the chat, and we'll see who finds it first, yeah? Okay. All right, ready? So let's bring up our first Wonder Woman. So, for your first clue, so prior to NASA, her research engineering career re resulted in three patents. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that? Like, I'd know that jacket anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the position. Yeah. Yeah, America. Tell us again, what's her name? Elena Ochoa. Elena Ochoa, That's yes. pretty cool. So other fun facts for you guys uh, watching. Uh, she was the first Hispanic woman to go to space, yeah. and she recently just retired. But before that, she served as director of NASA's Johnson Space, uh, space Center, and she was the second woman to do so. Mm. That's pretty impressive. impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, not, it's a big center, yeah. It is. <laughs> Not too shabby for a career path, Elena Jordan. <laughs> cool. All right, let's go on to our second NASA woman. Get that up there. I will read you the first clue while we wait for her image. There she is. I she know exactly who that is. Of course. <laughs> Man, can I at least read the first clue? Yes, yes. Okay. I'll wait. <laughs> she was NASA's first female non-military chief of the astronaut office. Not too bad. She is. Hey, I'm, I'm going to give these two a chance if okay. you don't mind. <laughs> I'm biased because I worked with her for three missions. Oh, yeah. cool. Okay. All right. Yeah. She is NASA's most experienced astronaut, holding the American record for the most time spent in space, surpassing Jeffrey Williams and Scott Kelly in 2017 mm -hmm. with 665 days. Yeah. yeah. And she also holds the records for total spacewalks by a woman at 10 and the longest single space flight by a woman. So. Amazing. She clearly is amazing. Yasmin, why don't you tell us? That's Dr. Peggy Whitson. Yes! yes. <laughs> and you got to work with her. That's so cool. Yeah, we worked with her for three rodent research missions, and she's amazing. Very motivated, very committed. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Awesome. Very much enjoyed it. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, we're, we're going to move on to our third, third Wonder Woman, and I'm hoping that I can at least get through the first couple clues. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, she is known for her work analyzing data from wind tunnel experiments and real-world aircraft flight experiments. 
She was NASA's first African American female engineer. Yes, I know. But Dorothy. But, no. Not, no. No. but in the same group. And so along with uh, Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughn, she made it part of NASA's Langley oh, yeah. a research, uh, Langley's Research Center Human Computer Group. Mm -hmm. Human Computers, yes. That's familiar. So if it's not Katherine Johnson and it's not Dorothy Vaughn. Mary? Mary Jackson? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yasmin too. <laughs> do I have a prize at the end? You do. <laughs> which Satisfaction I will of think knowing of. your yes. history. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Number four. Are we ready? She helped launch NASA's first successful astronomical mission, the Orbiting Solar Observatory 1. She was the first chief of astronomy in the Office of Space Science and the first woman to hold an executive position at NASA. That's cool. And I love this. She is called the mother of Hubble through her oversight for planning and development of the Hubble Space Telescope. Wow. Cool. You know Hubble had a mother. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Does anybody know her name? No, no I don't. Yeah. Then let us introduce you to Nancy Roman. Mm, nice. <laughs> so cool. Honestly, cool. I, I didn't know her work either. And so I'm glad <laughs> yeah, to find out. <laughs> learn more about her later. Okay, and we are going to move on to our Wonder Woman number five. She lived underwater in an undersea habitat for nine days as a member of NASA's mission explore, uh, preparing astronauts for future exploration. She is the she's second on the list in com, in cumulative uh, spacewalk time by a female astronaut behind Peggy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that Suni? Yes, it is. Suni Williams. Yes. yes. Wow. And yes. another cool fun fact is that she was actually selected to fly aboard Boeing's uh, commercial crew commercial spacecraft. Crew, yeah. Didn't she also run a marathon? She oh, yeah, she did. Yeah. She, she, did. Yes. She, ran, she ran the Boston Marathon mm -hmm. on the ISS treadmill a couple so years cool. ago. Yeah. And she also completed a triathlon on right. the ISS. Other fun facts I learned. Swimming. Yeah. 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 So they, she Maybe had to swim. do uh, weight-bearing exercises that mimic the swimming. strokes of That's swimming. That's so funny. Uh, That's so awesome. Where there is a will, there is a way. Swim in space. Okay, so our clear winner was Yasmin. Oh, yes. <laughs> well done. Well played. You get a prize that we'll figure out later. All right. <laughs> All right so seriously, we got to move on because there's so much good information, and we're going to move into our Q&A. So our viewers have some questions for you. Mm -hmm. If you have a question now that you want to add, throw it in the chat, and we'll see how many we can get to before they have to go. So the first thing that Danielle and I wanted to know, right, was can you name a particularly memorable moment from your career? Do you have like a really favorite moment, a shining <laughs> example, or just a memorable one? I've got a memorable one, but it's probably not my favorite. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it involved a couple of fire trucks and some hazmat gear. Oh, no. Ooh. It was what late happened? one night in graduate school, and... We finally decided we should call my advisor and let her know that the fire trucks were coming. Oh, no. <laughs> it turned out okay in the end, but we had to evacuate the lab for a little while. Oh, shoot. And, um, what did you do, Laura? I didn't do anything, <laughs> but the, the vacuum doer broke uh, and oh. wound up releasing sulfur trioxide into the air, which is a really bad thing because yes, it, it mixes with the water in your lungs and makes sulfuric acid in oh, your lungs. Oh, oh. So, yeah. fortunately, I had the good sense to run screaming from the building yeah. after pulling the fire alarm. Mm -hmm. And all of the, I think the first year graduate students had been having a lecture down at the other end of the building because they were all just kind of standing around outside the door because somebody had pulled the fire alarm. <laughs> I just standing around. And I come screaming out of the building, lab coat, glasses. It's for real, she said, running out of the building. <laughs> and they all looked at me and started running. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty memorable. memorable. Wow. <laughs> right. Adventures in science. Oh, yeah. yeah. What about you? Gosh, every time we fr I do one of these things, you know, there is something memorable about mm -hmm. it. Um, I can tell you the last one, um, not as tragic as yours. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. We were uh, setting up Tegesat 8, which is the last one I put in, you know, the, we build and deliver, and uh, we were going to do thermovac. So basically we put it in the oven, we take all the air, uh -huh. and then we raise it to certain uh, temperature and lower the temperature. So 
you know, we put it in there with all the sensors, and then we had two people, you know, uh, mandating the whole, you know, because you have to wash the whole experiment for mm -hmm. the two days, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the guys are looking at the temperature, you know, and it's not changing. You know, it went up to certain, you know, like like 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and then it was going to come down, and it's not changing after two hours. And so they ended up calling somebody, and it turns out that the, you know, oven actually had a malfunction. So we had oh. to, we wasted the whole weekend, oh, no. and we needed to do this before, you know, we for delivering the satellite. So we were trying to scramble in where can we take the satellite you know, to do this testing, whether it was going to be Johnson Space Center or another uh, facility here around. So mm -hmm. okay. luckily the, the people in uh, the EEL, which is a facility here, mm -hmm. were able to um, fix the problem and okay. continue the experiment next, you know, a week later. But, you know, it was kind of stressful because we needed to <laughs> deliver the satellite in two weeks. So we're like, ah. Stress. <laughs> yeah. So that was the last one. But yeah. yes. a, a recent memorable. <laughs> yes, every single one. You know, we be able, we have one. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So what about you, Yasmin? Like, I'm sure dealing with rodents can be very memorable. I mean, space flight in general is always memorable. I mean, not every single launch is different. There's always, you know, first, uh, you know, working with crew is always, you know, a unique experience. Uh, for me, though, the most rewarding part of my job is when I can inspire someone else. So nice. I used to teach for a, a brief amount of time. And then, you know, here, you know, we always have interns. We have mm -hmm. students that come through the lab and we work with them. Um, so for me, like if I see that light bulb go on in, you know, like one out of 100 kids, that's mm. just the most rewarding part for me. And, you know, we've had students coming through our lab who did not really know what they wanted to do, but now, you know, they're in medical school or grad school getting their PhDs. And for me, you know, at, yeah. at the end of the day, it just makes it all the work worth it. Isn't that, that's, that's, yeah. oh, it's amazing. You changed a life right there, right? So cool. So, well, ladies, we would love to spend the rest of our episode <laughs> with you, but unfortunately we can't because we have another group of Wonder Women here at NASA. Yes, we do. So, unfortunately, we are going to have to say bye to you guys. Sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for, you for coming. coming. Such awesome stories. Should we Thank send them in for you? you? <laughs> uh, well, we'll be calling them right in in a moment. All Thank right. you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> So just as a reminder for everybody watching at home, this is NASA in Silicon Valley Live. And today we're celebrating National STEM Day by talking with some amazing Wonder Women of NASA. So if you have a question for our guests, write it in the chat and we'll try to get to more of them. We just have so much amazing information to cover that we sometimes run out of time. But, but that's a good thing, though. It's a good problem to have. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you want to introduce our second group? Yeah, so come on out, Diana, Jessica, and Kathy. Hey! Hi. Welcome! Hey, Welcome! Oh, this is the Black Crew. Did you guys plan that? Really? I miss I miss the dress code memo today. <laughs> Looks great. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Oh, oh, it looks like you guys are having a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> we were. And let, so let's do it again. <laughs> let's, like we did last time, just introduce yourselves and tell us a couple sentences about what you do at NASA. Catherine Bywaters. I'm an astrobiologist, and I work on life detection instrumentation. Interesting. We'll learn some more about astrobiology later. Awesome. I'm Jessica Marquez, and I work uh, in the Human Systems Integration Division, and I build software for mission control. Ooh. I'm Diana Gentry. I am a bioengineer, which means I get to wear many hats at the <laughs> intersection of science and math and technology. But I primarily look at ways of better measuring how microbes interact with their environments. Oh, okay, that's interesting. It's very interesting. That's a lot to unpack. But <laughs> before we do, like, when did you know that you wanted to be anything involved in space? Like, yeah. like how, how did you know? Start? What was your aha moment? Uh, well, it happened in stages. Um, I think the very first thing that set me on that path, I was about four years old, and my dad was watching TV. He said, oh, oh come here, come here, <laughs> sit down. This is very important. And it was the original Star Trek. Ah, and so I watched the whole series with him. And at that point, I, I, was, I was bitten by the space bug. And I thought, wow. clearly I need to be a scientist. 
And as I got a little older and in middle school and high school, I started to realize that I also really enjoyed math. And I also kind of enjoyed building things with my hands. And I thought, but science is really the most important thing. And uh, eventually I got to college and um, I was listening to a presentation about the various majors that they offered and so on and so forth. And I was talking with a classmate afterwards. He said, what are you interested in? And I said, well, I think I'm probably going to do biology, although I kind of wish I could also do math and maybe some engineering. And he said, well, you know, there's this bioengineering program. It's a little oh. weird and I don't know much about it. And I, it was this, I can have my cake and eat it too. Right, right. I, I didn't realize I didn't have to choose. <laughs> yeah. And so I, from, from then on, I, I kind of, I knew that was the direction I was going in. That's okay, awesome so speaking of bioengineering, I think we have a really cool and very interesting photo of you. So, right. <laughs> what, yes, is, I, what is going on oh, here? I understand. No, I don't. Um, what is going on? <laughs> so, uh, at, at my university, there's a tradition that when you go to graduate, you go in costume. And uh, as I said, uh, when I was studying math, I felt like I wasn't getting quite enough building things with my hands going on, and I might have gone a little bit overboard with this event. Um, and so I decided I was going to build a working shower stall that strapped onto my back <laughs> with plumbing and a water tank so I could spray water at people. And so I've got the curtain on, and you can see the faucet coming over there and the uh, shower cap on my mortarboard. Oh, it, it was a great day. <laughs> yeah, and it, uh, it, 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 uh, it didn't hurt that it was about 95 degrees that ah. day. And the, okay, so people yeah, I was glad of the water. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us really quickly before we move on, you told me a story about how you chose between math and engineering. Oh, yes. Um, this was probably uh, one of the best pieces of mentorship advice I ever got. Um, I was taking a kind of introductory engineering class. At the time, I thought I was probably going to be an applied math major. But the previous quarter, I had seen all of these people who were getting to do things like build little robots out of balsa wood and rubber bands that played frisbee and things like that. I, thought, I want to do that. Fine. So I was taking this class, and the, uh, the woman teaching it called me over about halfway through and said, you're doing very well in this class. I just wanted to know, are you planning to major in engineering? And I said, well, no, I think I'm going to be doing math. And she said, look. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are answer finders and there are problem solvers. Mm -hmm. The answer finder says, is this right? And the problem solver says, does this work? Mm -hmm. And you are clearly a problem solver. <laughs> you are going to be bored stiff in applied mathematics. Okay. Take some engineering where you actually get to build stuff and see the lights come on and the motors turn and so on and so forth. And if you really want the, you know, the more mathematical rigor, you can do that in grad school. And I, that was one of the best pieces of advice yeah. I ever got. It was yeah. absolutely true. Right. That simple comment made you realize, <laughs> oh, I'm that kind of person. I yeah. got to do engineering. Awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah, cool. What about you, Jessica? So I have always been interested in science and love learning and math and ever since I was a little kid. And I remember my dad taking me to uh, see the Halley's Comet. Uh, when it was passing and so I would always had this interest in science um, but it wasn't until I got to undergraduate and I was studying engineering at that point that I really understood uh, how I can contribute to uh, NASA and how mm -hmm. I can contribute to the space program um, so it was actually through an internship uh, here at NASA Ames and um, I learned about how NASA works uh, what kind of careers are involved in engineering or the different aspects um, that I could work on in order to contribute to human spaceflight. Um, and then that led me to apply to grad school, and that's where I really started focusing on the intersection of humans and engineering. So understanding how we can develop and create tools that support people um, in a very complex aerospace system. So um, my focus is always, how do I make this tool better for people? Okay. Um, and that's how I, I, that's what I do now here at NASA Ames. Okay. Well, let's bring up Jessica's origin <laughs> photo, because this is also a cool uh, one. Yeah, so this is a, a picture of me uh, back in 1998. I did my internship, and um, this cohort of class, um, we had a research project. Uh, we got to visit different NASA centers. This is a picture of us visiting uh, the space shuttle Atlantis when it was being refurbished. Mm. And uh, it just got me really excited about working with uh, people in human spaceflight. And uh, yeah. there's several cool. people in there that also already now still work at NASA. So it was a, a pretty great uh, set of teams. Yeah. And, and like not only at NASA, but didn't you mention that a lot of them are here at Ames as well? Yeah. So it was just like <laughs> um, our whole little cohort uh, was really uh, tight-knit and, and we all 
got the space bug and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, some of us work here, some of us work at uh, John Johnson Space Center. Um, yeah, and then um, our mentor for that program also uh, helped me get my job. So okay. it was quite a life-changing internship. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so internships are a great way to get started. Yeah, yeah, I agree, awesome. How about you, Kathy? Well, I had two aha moments, I think. Uh, first one was that when I knew I wanted to be a biologist. So my background, my educational background's a little unconventional. I completed sixth grade, and then my father moved my sister and I overseas, so that was pretty much the end of my education. Wow, really? Yeah, Ooh. until I moved back to the States and I started at a community college, and I took a biology class because I had no idea what it was really about. Mm -hmm. And I remember just sitting and learning about the inner workings of a cell, and it's like a whole nother world, a, a whole universe inside of, mm -hmm. of us that I had no idea even existed. So that's when I was fascinated with biology, and I, I was sold, had to do <laughs> biology. Absolutely. And then for when I decided I really wanted to be an astrobiologist was I went to Utah with a group of people to a Mars analog. And what an analog is, is it's an environment that replicates some aspect of something else. So okay. here it's, you know, it looks a lot like Mars, so that's mm -hmm. nice for, for the psyche, but it also is very dry and it has some of the same sorts of habitats that you might find on Mars. Wow. Okay. So going there and investigating that and really learning about extremophiles, so microbes that live under these extreme conditions, it's like, wow, someone's going to pay me to play in the dirt? <laughs> 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 Yes. Than this. <laughs> so that's that was my yeah. aha moment. Yeah, it's nice you brought a photo of that. I did. I did. I did. <laughs> There's like the Utah. Photo. There so you see in the background looks a lot, a lot of Mars like, and uh, this is a group of us just uh, hanging out, and the experts in the field were explaining the different environments and you know the different habitats and way the microbes were making a living, okay. and I was just fascinated. Yeah. So this is it. This, this is, is it. it. So then I know a little bit about what you went on to do because I'm lucky enough to have experienced some of Kathy's day in the life <laughs> um, when I went to cover this NASA research project doing their field campaign, field work. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what is a day in the life? A day in the life. So I do lab work as well as field work. Mm -hmm. And my lab work consists of testing different instrumentation that would go for looking for life on different planetary bodies. So Mars, Europa, Enceladus. And it's really thinking about the questions of, you know, how would we look for life? What would we look for? And what if it doesn't look like us? What, you know, what what sort of signatures can we pick up on? Right. So it's testing instrumentation, and then when not testing, and I think we actually have. Uh, uh -huh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that you brought this interesting little object. <laughs> <laughs> so everything for space flight needs to be lightweight and small. So actually, if you flip it around, okay. yeah. and we can open Oh, we can take it out. We can take it out. So if you see, there are two little wells there. The sample goes in one side and comes out the other. Hmm. If you apply a, a current through it, the sample will move through a tiny little fluidic channel and then through a tiny little nanopore. Hmm. As the bi mi biomolecules of interest go through the tiny, tiny, tiny pore, it disrupts the current. And then we can learn about what it is. So we can investigate DNA, RNA, oh, wow. proteins, viruses, all with something so cool. this small. So you're literally doing science that's small enough to fit in your pocket. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, look at that. Yes. And in and some then, fascinating places. And then yeah. I get to go and test uh, things like this out in the field. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, where I got to hang out with you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, the Atacama Desert, as it happens, which is so dry, it's a lot like Mars. So where is the Atacama Desert? So that is in Chile. Okay. Uh, and it is one of the driest locations on Earth, and its uh, rival would be the Antarctic Dry Valleys. Okay. And we go there because because it's so dry, it's a good analog for Mars again. Mm -hmm. And planetary bodies that are, you know, might be considered dead, but might have remnants of life or life making a living in very special environments. Mm -hmm. So we go there, and, you know, when you look out, it's very barren, there's no life, you don't see little bushes or plants anywhere. Uh, and so we have to be really careful not to contaminate the environment. We mm -hmm. get all suited up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at Kathy's photo in the desert. So you get 
Right, so there I am. Uh, we dug this hole, and then you have to wear the clean room suit, whole gown, and booties and hat, and be very careful to take your sample because any of you know your own microbes or your own DNA yeah. that gets contaminated in there will overwhelm the background. Oh, so you have to be very was, careful. Yeah, and, uh, that is and you in the hole. Right? That is me. <laughs> <laughs> That's me in the hole. I can't even tell. <laughs> Fascinating. So I that's think pretty. I'm very lucky, and I love love what I do. I mean, you get paid to play in the dirt, so exactly. I feel like that's any kid's dream. <laughs> so exciting! Awesome, thank you. How about you, Jessica? Um, so my main goal in um, at here is to develop software. So uh, the main focus that we do is billing, planning, and scheduling tools. And so I get to actually learn about everybody else's job in order to create these software tools. So, cool. And then I get to test field them um, in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, so I get to learn about um, how trainers might be um, teaching astronauts how to do their job. Wow. I get to go to mission control and learn how they control robots, how they manage the International Space Station, um, how they schedule astronauts' time. And all we take all that information in order to build and design our tools. And then we get to test them in different environments. So we've gotten to test them everywhere from underwater in the extreme environments of um, analogs. We also work in analogs. Mm -hmm. But these analogs don't necessarily have to simulate um, a planetary environment. It is simulating some aspect of mission control. Okay. Uh, so they have a slightly different, or they're trying to push uh, some aspect of human spaceflight, maybe isolation. Oh, um, yeah. mm -hmm. So we give them our tools and we get feedback. And so I've gotten to go to places like volcanoes and uh, the mission under the water, in underwater, yeah. um, the Arctic, mission control at Johnson Space Center. Um, so our tool has been up in Space Station, so that was also very exciting. Super cool. It's pretty cool. So mission control is it's like the the brain of the space missions, right, where they're controlling mm -hmm. what, it, how would you describe it? Yeah, so mission control, so we have astronauts up in space station and uh, they're super busy and the whole entire space station is managed by uh, a huge team of flight controllers back on ground. Okay. And so okay. they're uh, located physically in uh, Johnson Space Center, but there's also different uh, smaller mission controls mm -hmm. um, in Europe, um, in Japan, and we have another one in Alabama. We also actually have one here at NASA Ames, um, and they all coordinate to make sure that the space station is healthy, that all the science payloads are working, mm -hmm. and that we're keeping the science, um, the, sorry, the astronauts working. Um, if they have any questions, um, we keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. So, cool. did you bring a photo? Is I there think any? she, I think she did. Yes. And this one has a really cool background story. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so this is a picture of me in uh, at NASA Johnson Space Center uh, in Mission Control. So this is uh, when we did our first deployment of our tool up in Space Station. Um, so I got to sit down in uh, Mission Control and got to talk on the loops, uh, which is just the, the way they talk, the, the, the communication loops that they have. Um, and yeah, it was very exciting. We got to uh, talk to the astronauts and work with them um, that whole week that we were there. So your voice is forever, like, down in the NASA records. Yeah, so I was actually very <laughs> hesitant to talk during uh, during the mission, and um, one of my colleagues was uh, sitting in the front room, so there's actually multiple, not only are there thousands of people, there are multiple rooms. So I was sitting in one of the back rooms, and someone in the front room calls over and is like, can you please give me a status on Playbook? That's our tool. And so he forced me to actually talk on the loop so that my voice was forever recorded. <laughs> Were you at all tempted to say, Houston, we have a problem? Uh, <laughs> no, I actually was very hesitant about talking because it is, um, they are listening to so many conversations that I didn't want to like add to that problem or add to that uh, workload. Um, so I was actually very much like, I'm going to just be here unless I have to talk. I'm only going to talk. And then he called me out and he's like, it's you okay. Your opportunity. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, cool. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. So what about you, Diana? Like, what is the day in the life? Um, it's very seasonal. Oh. oh. Um, so in the um, wintertime, most of what I'm doing is uh, benchtop work. So um, we build these devices that you can grow microbes in, and uh, we can control the environments on a very small scale mm -hmm. and with a bunch of sensors attached. And so... 
we can expose them to different types of environmental stresses and we can see how they respond to that. Um, in the summer, um, we are frequently out in um, Mars analog environments like the type that Kathy was talking about. In particular, we tend to visit uh, recent eruption sites in Iceland. Um, one of the things that I work on is instrumentation for life detection. And one of the things that's very important with life detection is that you have to know what your null case is, what your baseline is. And that's actually extremely difficult to do on Earth because life is everywhere and oh, yeah. very hard to kill. <laughs> um, so we go to recent eruption sites that have basically cooled down just enough that you can walk on them and go out there with your instrument. And we try and figure out what it will actually read when there shouldn't be any life there. Yeah, okay. Like to set your instrument at zero, <laughs> kind of, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then in the spring and the fall, which is fog season around here in the Bay Area, I work on a project that develops payloads for drones, for UAVs, mm -hmm. and that captures fog and cloud water for biochemical analysis so that we can see what's up there in the fog and if it's alive and if it's doing anything. So why fog? <laughs> right. Like, I know it's very prevalent around here, but yeah, that it is. Why, why exactly? Like, what's so special about fog? Um, so, the, so the core question that we're trying to get at is, is life possible on an extended basis in the absence of stable surface water? And on Earth, this isn't an issue because all of the fog that we have cycles fairly rapidly through having been puddles or lakes or rivers or mm -hmm. the ocean, and then it comes up into the atmosphere, and then it comes back down again. But if you look at a planet like, say, Venus, where the surface is way too hot for there to be any stable liquid mm -hmm. there, but you have kilometers and kilometers of much cooler, dense clouds above the surface, is that an area that we should consider a possible habitat? Hmm. Interesting. It's pretty amazing. That's actually really cool. We have a photo of you <laughs> on the one of the volcano trips, right? We do. Is that? Yeah. Yes. Tell us and about uh, that. so uh, this trip actually melded a little bit of the two. So I'm standing in front of a hydrothermal vent. So there's basically a hot spot under the ground that is hot enough that it's forcing boiling hot water up to the surface. And so we've got a combination of boiling hot water coming up off of the ground, and then it's mixing with the very cool air and causing a ton, ton of steam to condense. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so that interface is very interesting in terms of what's alive, what survives, how far does it get carried, um, and what kinds of chemistry is in there that could possibly be the foundation for stuff to eat. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Fascinating. Actually really cool. Cool stuff, you guys. All right, so <laughs> folks, we have to make a decision, I think. We're going to run out of time. Mm -hmm. So. Do you want to talk about the weirdest moment in your science or the most memorable favorite moment and answer some questions? Danielle, do you have a preference? Um, I, I have say, a preference. You do? <laughs> I can say weird science because you guys get to do some really cool things, <laughs> experience some really cool things, and also happen to be documented while you're doing these really cool things. That's true. Why don't we roll into weird science? If you want to tell us something else, you can do that. <laughs> you want to you read no, this? No, weird okay. science was the one I it wanted. It was? Oh, uh, <laughs> yes. All right. I wanted to take questions. <laughs> I liked it dangerously. <laughs> so weird science. This is the part of the show where we want to hear from our guests about the craziest things that they've done in the name of science. Okay, so Kathy, you're up first. Let's go ahead and bring up her photo of Weird Science. And then, yeah, oh wow. So wow. I think uh, my Weird Science, one of the weirdest things I've done for science, would be to spend four months on a deserted island in the Canadian high Arctic. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> With the six other people. And uh, it, it turned out great. We had a great crew. You know, we, we still talk to each other, so that's uh, that should be a good that sign. something. Um, but it was looking at the transition between the uh, winter to spring thaw in the active layer above the permafrost, and we were doing it in simulation. So we had the isolation effect. We were on Mars time. Uh, so you've got a few extra minutes in the day. And being in the uh, Arctic, it's light all, all the time so we could create our own light-dark cycles. So we took advantage of that. 
and I uh, got to go out and take some great samples. And that was, I was uh, two of us out in the oh, field gosh. returning home <laughs> after a long day. Yeah. And I'd say that has to, that had to have been like probably one of the coolest things that you've done. <laughs> I would think so. I, it definitely is one of the more unique things that I've done. Yeah, that photo's great. amazing. Thank you. So good, good that's, story. that's my weird science. All right. <laughs> nice. So what about you, Jessica? Like you said that you get the opportunity to be a day in the life of these other people when you're trying to help them build platforms. Yes. Like what's your weird science? So my weird science is uh, not that, <laughs> but it was the opportunity. So one of the things that you learn in grad school is that you, especially if you're doing research with humans, you always volunteer for your uh, classmates' uh, experiments. <laughs> so I have always volunteered for everybody's experiment. Everybody volunteers for my experiments. So when I hear it was here at, at Ames, I volunteered uh, to be on the Vomit Comet. And what, is that? and what is that? So that's an airplane that does parabolic flight. So it goes up and it comes down. And so depending on its uh, trajectory, you get different uh, amounts of gravity. Oh. And so uh, we, in this particular flight, we were doing lunar gravity. So I have um, experienced lunar gravity, How and cool that was that? really cool. And um, the the purpose of the experiment was to understand how blood flows in partial gravity. Uh -huh. um, so I was all instrumented up with a whole bunch of electrodes, and yeah. they took a, a echogram of my heart and while I was in um, on the parabolic flight. Okay. And so, so you know, I was, think we have a photo of you yeah. Yeah. all strapped you up. in lunar gravity. <laughs> uh, so you could see all the electrodes, and it was actually really cool. It made me think about all sorts of interesting challenges in terms of like how would we build things in partial gravity because um, there's still enough weight to you, but mm -hmm. not a lot, and so it has like this very interesting mixture because the microgravity we, we know how to design things for microgravity it's mm -hmm. well, sort of we know yeah we know what to expect in some ways that's um, like on the space station right yeah in the space yeah. station but lunar is like we spend so little time on it so mm -hmm. there's a whole whole slew of design problems there that's fascinating very cool very cool all right well diana are you up for sharing a weird science <laughs> moment um well i i can't top kathy's story here <laughs> um but in our uh, Iceland trips, because one of the things that we're looking for is very, very low levels of life, we also have to get very far away from any other place that people normally go because mm -hmm. people shed life everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so we um, have a tiny little hut that we drive out to and spend the night at and then spend another couple of hours <laughs> driving to in the morning to get out to our sites. We take our samples, we bundle them all back on top of the Land Rover, and then we come all the way back and spend another night in the tiny little hut in Iceland, which even in the summer isn't that warm. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, should we see it? I think we should see it. We have a photo. <laughs> there yep. it is. So we got to fit eight people in there. <laughs> what? Um, and so we basically uh, repeat cycles of this for three weeks at a time. This is um, a human factors experiment. <laughs> <laughs> an intentional one, yes. <laughs> That's crazy. That's I, I have cool. to say, I saw that and I thought it might be an outhouse, <laughs> but in fact, it housed eight people. Right. It turns out it's very important to select your collaborators by whether or not they snore. Oh, Ooh. right, right. Good thing Kathy didn't have a snorer, <laughs> I guess, in the Arctic. Mm. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies, Fabulous. It seems that we have again run out of time. Mm -hmm. And while we would love to spend the rest of our show with you guys, we unfortunately have to thank you, well, thank you and guys. say thank goodbye. You, happy STEM Day. Yes, <laughs> happy STEM Day indeed. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So remember, you guys are watching NASA in Silicon Valley Live. Today we're celebrating National STEM Day by talking to some of the amazing Wonder Women of NASA. And if you have any questions for our guests, uh, feel free to write them in the chat. And if you want to learn more uh, about women at NASA, you can go to women.nasa.gov. Fabulous. All right. So let's go now to our fabulous aeronautics crew. Let's bring out Nettie, Patricia, and Sarah. Come on out. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Welcome. Pull Welcome. the chair. Sorry, we're having way too much fun yes. out here. We want to come have fun too. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So Should... first things first, can you ladies introduce yourselves? And I know you guys are all aerospace engineers, but what exactly do you do? Okay, I'll start. Uh, my name is Nettie Roosboom. I am an aerospace engineer, and I lead our pressure-sensitive paint 
technology here at NASA Ames. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm Patricia Ventura. I'm an aerospace engineer also, and actually I work in the supercomputing division here at NASA Ames. Supercomputing, okay. awesome. <laughs> My name's Sarah D'Souza, and I design guidance and control systems for spacecraft. Ooh. Very cool. All right. Should we find out where you come from? <laughs> I think, I how think about we your origin stories? How, yeah. how did you know you wanted to do this? So I will claim that I knew when I was eight months. Eight months? Eight months. <laughs> months, <laughs> not years. I kid. Uh, when I was, why I kid is because when I was, um, a freshman in college, or sorry, a sophomore in college, I was able to get a uh, internship at Johnson Space Center and work us alongside astronauts who were on the space shuttle. And um, many years later, my sister was going through our photo album and she, she sent me a picture. And it was a picture of my mom holding me when I was a baby and it, with a picture of the space shuttle in the back oh, in our room. Wow. And I just, I just think, Everything I've done throughout my life has been influenced by my family right. and what we did as kids. Um, I've like always loved space cool. and it's always been something I love. I guess your parents did too. Yes. <laughs> Let's see it. You, you brought a copy of the photo. I did. So I did. Aww. There it is. It's my mom. And my dad took the picture. And <laughs> my dad is very much a space enthusiast. Um, and a dreamer, and I definitely get that from my dad, too. Awesome. <laughs> nice. Nice story. That's pretty cool. So what about you, Patricia? So actually, uh, I remember that my grandmother took me to the planetarium when I was like uh, four years old, and then I was so surprised by all the stars you could see, and so it, I thought at that point that I wanted to do something <laughs> space-related, and then when you know, when they always ask kids, what do you want to do when you're like a grown up? Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was always saying an astronaut. But then when I was in high school, I, I was very good in math and then in physics. So I decided to go for engineering and well, I could do space or so aerospace engineering. Okay. So yeah. So we have a photo of yeah. a young you. Can we get that brought up on screen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not very old photo. <laughs> That's a younger a, you. Yeah. <laughs> so that photo is three years old. Is it was taken I think one month after I started my internship here at NASA Ames, mm -hmm. and it was the first time I visited the supercomputer, and I was so surprised. It was so big and loud. Also, so does that supercomputer happen to have a name that we may know about? Yeah. So that one is the Pleiades supercomputer. Uh, but here at Ames, we have another supercomputer that is called Electra, mm -hmm. and we're actually building a third one. No, oh, nice. so. that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've yeah. heard of those Pleiades and Electra, right? <laughs> cool. So what about you, Nettie? Like, what's what's your origin story? Yeah, I I grew up in Tennessee. I remember going to see a. Um, see the St. Louis Arch and I remember driving across the bridge and, and going to the St. Louis Arch and I just, you know, I looked at both of these things. I was studying drafting in high school and I was like, wow, I, these are extremely impressive and I, I want to do whatever it is that can produce something like this. So, uh, you know, I went into uh, college, uh, started studying mechanical engineering and then uh, I found fluid dynamics, thermodynamics and I thought, wow. You're speaking my love language. Like, it, like the world made sense at that moment, and so I, I just kept wiggling my way. That uh, I had an internship as well here at NASA Ames. Uh, I wiggled my way over to the wind tunnel division. I thought, wow, this is really cool. You have these giant compressors and radiators and all the things that you had studied there in your in your textbooks were here in life and oh, yeah. like huge. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and then I found my way over to pressure sensitive paint, which which was just uh, a great uh, melody of like hardware, software. Uh, wind tunnels, so uh, I'm really in my happy place. Awesome. <laughs> so we have a photo oh. of young Nettie. <gasps> yes. Oh, oh. oh dear. Look at the arch. Look at you. Uh, and we know what's going on in your head yeah. at that moment. Yeah, I, love I this stuff. Uh, yeah, and you know, I didn't know before we went there that you could go up in this little tram and go the whole way oh. across. It's crazy. It was really neat. Did you uh, get in the tram? Yeah, I did. Across? I remember my dad mentioning something like, "Oh, I feel uh, this is must be how a chick feels in an egg." <laughs> you were you were crammed in there. <laughs> oh, okay. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So should we go back to basics for just yes. a moment and do some vocabulary? Right? Yes. Because yeah. you guys have mentioned computational fluid dynamics and wind tunnels and whatnot, but I know that was new to me when I got to NASA. 
So can you tell us really quickly, what's yeah. a wind tunnel? Really quickly with a wind tunnel, uh, you don't know how an aircraft is going to fly mm -hmm. in space. So instead of throwing the aircraft through the air, we hold the aircraft still and we blow the wind over the aircraft. All right. Okay. Okay. So you bring the, the model to the air. Yes. Yes. Okay. Very cool. All right. And I know you do a lot of work in there, so we're going to talk mm -hmm. yeah. more about that later. Yeah. So like, what about CFD or commonly known as computational fluid oh. dynamics? Yeah, so that's what I do. Um, so it means we simulate the flow of uh, air or uh, anything. It just has to be a fluid around uh, your geometry. And with uh, supercomputers, we get to see the performances, the acoustics. We calculate the pressure distribution. We can improve the designs. And uh, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Pretty neat. Uh, I think we have no. a comment from Nettie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fluid dynamics made sense to her? <laughs> that was pretty much the most horrible thing I ever had to deal with, right. says Zalazar. Oh. <laughs> but see, I think that's the beauty of engineering is that there's things that really click with someone and, and they love and really embrace and, mm -hmm. and it is their love language. And then yeah. there's other things where you're like, why would you even study this? Yeah, so yeah, it's, right. it's, that's a beautiful reason for having diverse <laughs> folks looking at the same problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so also, so I uh, wanted to remind you guys, and also for our viewers at home, that the first A in NASA is aeronautics. Oh, yes. of course. And so uh, yeah. Ames Research Center is one of the leaders in that research. And for all you fun facts at home, we <laughs> are the second uh, aeronautics lab. In the country, In the country, right? behind Langley. We were yeah. there in the very yep. establishment. In establishment. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> There's so many realms. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so we're gonna move up. we're gonna move along. So we're gonna do your origin story. So it's like when did you ladies know that you wanted to be an aerospace engineer? You wanna let's start, start with let's start with Nettie. Yeah, um well I <laughs> I, you know, it was really here at NASA Ames that I, you know, I was studying mechanical and so that's where I made the leap over to aerospace engineering. Um and you know that's how I found pressure sensitive paint. Um, maybe we yeah. want to. And so piggybacking yeah. on that, let's talk about your day in the life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a day in my life, uh, like the other women that came before. You know, we have a very uh, diverse set of days. Um, it depends, you know, if we're planning, if we're trying to execute, or if we're processing data. Um, yeah. So uh, we have different customers that I work with that come to the wind tunnel. And they come to me and they say, I want pressure sensitive paint on my model. And I say, great, uh, what do you expect? What do you want? Um, and then uh, we do this planning. Uh, we actually install the model in the wind tunnel and then I paint the wind tunnel model. <laughs> something similar to this? Oh, well, where'd you get this? <laughs> just, it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, we'll take large wind tunnel models. This one's a small replica. Um, but, you know, one that we have worked on in the past, maybe about a foot and a half in diameter that we'll put in the wind tunnel model. Um, I'll paint it with a base coat and then I'll paint it with a top coat. And with this top coat uh, has a, a luminescent molecule that responds to oxygen. And why oxygen is interesting is because uh, partial pressure of ox oxygen is pressure. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so this, this paint will sense how much oxygen is in the air, um, and so we read that as pressure. Um, why that's interesting is that, you know, traditionally we put um, pressure taps on the wind tunnel model in a discrete location, so we only know the pressure at that specific location, but now, as you can see with the pink model here, we can sense everywhere there's pressure. So now that we know the pressure of the mo uh, over the model, we know the area of the model, then we can know the forces that the model is seeing. Okay, so you know, I think we have a photo of you. Oh uh, yeah, in your, in <laughs> yeah, your area. that's oh, me in that. my in my domain. Yeah, yeah. So that was a recent test. Uh, as y'all know, we're NASA is developing the largest rocket um, ever built, and we will be going to the moon onto Mars, and we are sending different rovers and things into deep space. Uh, and so this is the crew version of SLS, and it was here testing in our wind tunnels back in December, and we took uh, pressure sensitive paint measurements on it uh, then. So yeah, it's it's a lot of fun to be um, 
applying this technology to uh, you know this next generation of space oh, yeah. vehicles and uh, aircraft that NASA is producing. Okay. Super cool. Yeah. So what about you, Patricia? Like, what's a day in the life? So I, sp I spend most of my time in front of computers, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, Supercomputers. No, but Supercomputers. <laughs> well, but, uh, my computer is a regular computer. I just connect to the supercomputer. Yeah. Yeah. But um, so my work consists on uh, computational fluid dynamics, as we mentioned before. And so we model the geometry of uh, our aircraft or rotorcraft. We like that one? Like that <laughs> one. Daniel's busy, but let's. <laughs> yeah. It is so, big. All yeah. right. So this is a drone, yeah? Yeah, this is a drone. Um, so for this case, for example, we obtain the geometry, and then I spend a lot of time meshing that geometry. That means uh, so removing a lot of details that we don't need for the CFD. And then we put points everywhere on the surface. That's where we're going to solve our fluid dynamics equations. And then we need to fill the rest of the space around the, the vehicle. So we, we like model uh, a bigger volume around the, the, the drone. And after, once I'm confident with my mesh, I, I run the simulation with the supercomputer. Um, so we use. Uh, from 1,000 to 2,000 processors, and okay. that's a lot of processors, and it takes a few days to wow. okay. complete. Wow, that's a and complex then, calculation. Well, first, yeah, <laughs> first we, I, I need to be sure I haven't made any mistakes. <laughs> sure. And yeah. then we, co we check the solutions, we, we see if there are problems with the geometry design, and we might, we might modify the, the geometry to find better, mo more performant, Quieter, safer vehicles. Mm, okay. okay. So mm -hmm. I just want to review. You were talking about you get the geometry of mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. flying vehicle, right? So <laughs> are, do you like do you scan it somehow to get its shape? Yeah. So on your first, computer. Yeah. So we first we scan the geometry, but uh, the scan is not 100 percent precise. So sometimes it's a bit wiggle. Mm -hmm. So then we need to spend a lot of time. Uh, smoothing that geometry. Okay, so you so, get the perfect shape, the outline yeah. of this and perfect aircraft. and real. Like okay. it has to real. be close to the, yes, the real close, model. As close to reality uh -huh, as you can get uh -huh. it. Okay, so, uh, you know, I think we have a photo of, yeah, of one of those scans. Of exactly. of those scans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's the wow. surface mesh of this vehicle, and then so I think it had. So that's the surface, but once I did the volume mesh, so. Uh, the complete uh, mesh, it has uh, 500 million grid points. Wow. Which is a lot. Oh, <laughs> 500 million. That stops being something I can that, really that's, that's why we need a supercomputer. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and then what is the final result of all that work? What, so, what, what can we see? So that comes we out can of visualize the flow. Uh huh. Uh, then we can calculate the forces on the vehicle, the same thing with, with the wind tunnels. But uh, because everything is with the supercomputer, then I can just modify the geometry. I don't have to rebuild a different drone. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. We see. can also visualize the acoustic field. We can see if it's quiet or noisy. Um, can we see the visualization you brought? Yeah. <laughs> Let's bring up that simulation. So, so is that that drone flying? So actually, that's a modification we did of that drone. If you see the front rotors, they are mounted underneath of the arm. So when we first ran the simulation for the original drone, we saw that the wake of the rotors was interact the four rotors was interacting with the aft rotors and reducing the performances. So we figured we might mount the rotors in the front underneath to avoid these interactions. And actually, this vehicle is 60% uh, more efficient than the original one. Oh, wow. And That's yeah, for all the colors we could see there was a pressure and oh. the spaghetti things, uh, that's the vortex wake. <laughs> All right. That's pretty cool. That's super cool. Yeah. Supercomputing is super cool. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. All right. Um, how about we we'll get Sarah's day I, in the life yeah, and then so we'll Sarah, get to some other objects they brought to share. <laughs> All right. I will say my day in the life is being able to work with wonderful people like Nettie and Patricia here <laughs> yes. because we take the data that they 
create and tell us about how the vehicle performs and use that in our simulations to tell us can we really fly these vehicles mm -hmm. within the requirements and the uh, environments that we want to fly them in. So for example, with an aircraft, uh, with their simulations and the wind tunnel results, we can validate that we have good predictions of what our aerodynamics are for a particular uh, aircraft mm -hmm. and then verify that it can actually get from point A to point B. So for example, one of um, the uh, X-planes that uh, um, NASA has going right now, which is an experimental aircraft, right. X-59, they use this information to be able to model in the national airspace how these vehicles will perform. And we can actually understand, can they integrate well? Can a pilot actually uh, maneuver this vehicle with the performance that results from the geometry. Right. So my day in the life is I get to build simulations, integrate them together, um, and much like them, I didn't go into it as a specific field, but I love fluids. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I, yeah. Like, that visualization was amazing. I just, yeah. I love it. So it's just being able to work with other engineers and then apply my own expertise. Um, I end up in a lab or in front of a computer or uh, at another center trying to figure out how we can bring all of our, all the tools that NASA has and leverage them together. Yeah, yeah, and yeah and I think that's a great um, example of like NASA aeronautics that it's, uh, you know, you don't, you don't build a house with just wind tool, so we don't build an airplane with just wind tool. We do wind tunnel testing, we do CFD, we do simulations, and you know, over a course course of several years, uh, you know, we come and we develop an aircraft that is produced, and uh, people will fly one day and we'll ride around supersonically. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So we have a, a video of, of a project you've worked on, right? Mm -hmm. It's a heat yes. shield. Could so another us? another part of this is. We can't exactly use wind tunnels yet. I mean, not yet. I should say it's more like arc jets where mm -hmm. you can test whether or not the uh, entry vehicle can take the temperatures you have. Mm -hmm. But we currently don't have a way to like test a spacecraft in a relevant environment of high speed and high heat mm -hmm. in, and have it kind of move the way it, way it, do, mm -hmm. the way it does when you fly a, an aircraft in air on, the, in, on Earth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so uh, we have to do a number of different things, which is build simulations with CFD. So we get most of our aerodynamic predictions, forces and moments from CFD, from Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then apply those to our simulations. And the video you're gonna see is a technology here at Ames uh, called ADAPT, which is the uh, <laughs> Adapt 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 adaptable, deployable, and entry placement technology. <laughs> <laughs> it tells you everything you need to know about it, yeah. almost everything. Um, so we'll show you uh, footage of that, and it kind of gives you a sense of what the operations are expected for that kind of vehicle. Okay, okay. All right. so let's go ahead and let's take a look. Oh. What's happening here? Oh, so the, it's deploying the uh, the command module and the and what I'll call the the entry vehicle. And now the entry vehicle or adept is deploying, and it'll separate from the service module and prepare its attitude to enter the atmosphere of a planet. So here it's Mars, and you see it's it because of its high speed at entry, it has a high heat pulse that it goes through. Mm -hmm. and it's very important that that entry technology protects whatever payload it's landing. Um, uh, via that uh, thermal protection system right. that is facing uh, the Earth as it enters. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and you're working on the the part behind. I'm working on the that, stuff behind it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it in the right way. Yes, cool, excellent. Pretty cool. So we are going to move into our next segment. It's yeah. called Show and Tell. Uh, it's where, as the name suggests, we asked our guests to bring in something fun and unique to show us from the lab. And tell us about it. Yeah. And just, just bring it out again. <laughs> All right. So, Nettie gave us a preview of yeah. this special stuff from her lab, but I still have questions about it. Well, yes. Yeah. Are you paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So, you have a model yes. in the wind tunnel. Yes. 
And in the past, you used to have sensors installed yeah. To, yeah. to capture the pressure, the air pressure yeah. readings, right? But this is a newer, yeah. better, bigger, better way yeah. of doing yeah. it. Yeah, and kind of along the same um, lines as earlier, is like, you know, when we come to a wind tunnel test, there's different tools that we can do use to um, measure flow, measure pressure, measure force in a wind tunnel test. So traditionally, it was pressure taps, and we still do a lot of testing with pressure taps. So uh, often when um, we're going to test either an aircraft or a spacecraft, we talk about, like, is pressure-sensitive paint um, realistic to use? And hmm. sometimes it's, uh, you know, no, we just need pressure taps. We don't need to spend the time and money to do okay. the whole pressure-sensitive paint. Other times, uh, you know, we need to know more about what's happening on the surface of the vehicle, and measuring the surface pressure is very insightful. Um, so different vehicles, we've done all three of the commercial crew vehicles, um, we've done space launch system, uh, we've done several of the X-planes uh, using the pressure-sensitive paint. So it's a, a new technology, it uses, it uses optics, so, you know, we have the, the paint, which is interesting because there's the whole chemistry of the paint, mm -hmm. the application science of the paint, um, and then the data acquisition. So we use UV lights to excite this paint. It responds to oxygen, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And so the, the oxygen is going to come in and quench these molecules. So the luminescent molecules, they're shining really bright, as we saw in the, mm -hmm. the picture earlier. It's right. this fluorescent pink light. Um, the oxygen molecules come in and make it shine really dim. So oxygen Oxygen means there's um, higher pressures present. Okay. If there's an absence of oxygen, so a lower pressure, then it's not starving the uh, luminescent molecules of energy. So it's shining really bright. Yeah. Okay. So okay. we use uh, you know eight to twelve cameras mounted around the wind tunnel, uh, and we will record the intensity that is being. Um, uh, emitted by the paint. Right. So you can know the pressure at every point yeah, on yeah. that yeah, object, think, right, um, at every yeah, moment? In a, yeah. In a previous episode of NASA and Silicon Valley Live, a few of my colleagues came on and, yeah. and were talking about, uh, you know, sensing the, the PSP and, um, you know, we equate, like, you know, we use cameras that have one million pixels on them. And we use, for some of these, we use like up to eight um, or 12. So you can imagine we have 12 million pixels wow. looking at this vehicle. So that's essentially 12 million instruments that we're using to sense pressure. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. on traditional models, maybe there's 200 or 300 pressure taps. Um, if there's a lot, sometimes we'll do it even with just 12 pressure taps. But yeah, using um, the, you know, the knowledge of uh, and the technology behind um, high-speed cameras, high-intensity lighting that we use to excite this paint, um, and the, and the um, technology that's come along with the paint, um, it's really made this possible. That is so cool. cool. Yeah, and fun fact for y'all, I want to give a, a shout out to you, the director of NASA Glenn, uh, Janet Cavandi. She had her start in PSP, yeah, or she yes, did she her did. PhD in PSP chemistry and yeah. did some of the very early uh, wind tunnel tests involving PS using PSP here at NASA Ames. So. Very cool. Very cool. Janet. <laughs> <laughs> Another Wonder Woman of NASA. Yeah. Yes. I have a question. So yeah. You have two bottles. Yes. What are the two th different yeah. things? Uh, yeah, this is the base coat, um, and this is the top coat. So, oh, okay. uh, yeah, we need both of these for the paint to work. Um, and, and uh, you know, often with painting this, it, uh, it, this is where all my stress lies, is that <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I take a lot of pride in the, in the paint job, and that's one reason why I also love PSP, is like, you know, there's this artistic, oh, cool. um, you know, <laughs> learned art behind it that you don't just slap it on, like, uh, yeah, yeah, I want it to do well so that the paint responds well. Yeah. Cool. What a cool job! So <laughs> how long does it take for you to, to paint and to prepare uh, these models using your pressure sensitive paint. Yeah, yeah. Um, for some of the larger models, like we saw in the photo, um, let's, let's go ahead and get that brought back up on screen. <laughs> yeah, you know, that um, since we do several different layers um, and then we actually have to cure it, so I will bake the solvent out of the paint. That, huh. that took about eight hours to paint. So, uh, you know, this paint is toxic, so we wear respirators. So uh, I would say that's one of the more 
uh, like the two physical parts of the job are crawling around this wind tunnel and, and mounting all the cameras and lamps, which is a lot of fun. You get to use your hands and use mechanical skills and think of ways to design lamp mounts, camera mounts to, to make things better. But uh, yeah, and then the, the painting, uh, wearing that hood for eight hours and then you know, finally coming out and taking a breath of fresh air. Uh, so. Wow, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> you do a lot of different things in your job. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, I think we should keep going. Yeah. Can oh, someone grab have... Patricia's object? Yeah. Parts of this look kind of familiar to me, but I don't actually know what they amount to. So that's it. Yep. So yeah. this is a supercomputer node. It's oh, cool. one of the 1800 Sandy Bridge nodes we have in the Pleiade supercomputer. 1800 of these? 1800. Wow. And then, so each of these has uh, 16 processors, so you just need to multiply. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, we, all, we don't only have Sandy Bridge nodes, we have a bunch of EB Bridge nodes, Broadwell nodes, Haswell nodes. Skylake note we just got. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know what any of those I, things are, yeah. but there are a lot of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so basically, um, air comes from here, and then it cools down the two uh, processor, like the nodes. Uh, so there are is a double, and then it comes out here, uh, and then there is like a water system. Oh, okay. To cool down the air. Yeah because there's so much computing happening, right? Yeah, <laughs> so much, yeah. yeah it's <laughs> it generates a lot of heat, so wow. you need to cool it down. Super cool. How, does, how cool. does this compare to my computer? Like, in, do, do you know any facts about how um, much more powerful this might be? Um, I don't know, it might be 10 times better mm -hmm, okay. than your computer. Yeah, okay, yeah. and then do okay. do that math for the, all <laughs> the 16 processors, 1,800 of them. Yeah, yeah. and Amazing. it's only the Sandy Bridge notes. Yeah. Oh, right, right, and then all those other guys, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it's crazy. We have uh, so many computers. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's a big computer. Yeah. Um, I would add, um, if we didn't have this, right, mm -hmm. I mean, the length of time it would take you yeah. to calculate. Oh, I, can't, I, can't I mean, uh, it's not can, even possible. It's not, exactly. It's, not it's like possible. it would take you years to do, yeah. like, the simulation that you so, did. So, yeah, it would take me years. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> imagine <laughs> you, if I you made like, a hit mistake. start, oh, and then it was like, I <laughs> know, oh, you wouldn't know until, start. like, 20 years later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like, a really cool example for National STEM Day that, like, uh, you know, maybe computational fluid dynamics isn't your thing, but maybe uh, other areas of fluids oh, and right. heat transfer, mm -hmm. like, you know, the design of these. And, yep. you know, when you yeah. look at the picture from Patricia uh, and yeah. seeing all those different nodes and, like, heating and cooling, well, not heating, but cooling is a big issue. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, and keeping it at a certain temperature. Yeah. And I think the other thing, like, with the supercomputer, it's, like, not just used by the CFD group. Like, yep. People like Sarah and I hop on there oh, and, yeah. and, like, you know, you try out things on your laptop in your office. But, <laughs> man, I really need to make this work faster. So yeah. hop on the supercomputer. Yeah. It's a great resource that we have here at NASA Ames that to be able cool. to use. Yeah, cool and even NASA. Yeah. yeah, cool story is that the new supercomputer, the Electra supercomputer, was designed using the supercomputer. Oh. <laughs> So it's like, like trying to answer yeah. the question, like, yeah. who came first, the chicken or the egg? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They simulated their flow to cool down the oh, new supercomputer. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Fun fact. Nice. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Should we okay. get yeah, we can go. We can. Um, I might ask Patricia to move, maybe move the note over. <laughs> no, we can, because this is a big Let's one. Yeah. So... Watch your head, Abby. Uh, oh, oh, wow. <laughs> so, it's a big candy bowl. What I brought today. Oh, yeah. Candy bowl. <laughs> this, this would be great at like different. <laughs> I could see some yeah. dip going in there. Yeah. I want. I, I think this has a little bit more important news, yeah. but um, no. So this is kind of a partially stowed adapt vehicle. Okay. So it's a uh, one meter. Um, when fully stowed, it, it comes out to one meter in diameter. Um, I'm showing you the back side of the adapt aeroshell. If you re reference the video from the yeah, beginning, that's what we saw in the you video, saw right? the nose and the forward facing side of the vehicle going through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and this material here uh, is a 3D uh, woven fabric that is essentially the thermal protection system. Wow. That enables a technology where we're able to stow the vehicle on launch and uh, create a technology that allows us to uh, land larger payloads on Mars um, and allow us to 
um, uh, stow that uh, payload. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting assigned the, the cameras. It allows us to stow this payload in existing rockets so we don't have to um, build new rockets to launch this kind of vehicle because we can grow the mass without growing the, the vehicle itself as big as the payloads that we want to land on Mars. Right. Oh, this, this has to be cool. big enough for, to cover a larger right. spacecraft? Exactly. Okay. So, um, so why I'm showing you the backside of this is to show you, one, that it is not like your Apollo capsule, right, mm -hmm. where it's covered on the back. Mm -hmm. And that poses a really big design challenge for us, which mm -hmm. is how do we put uh, the kind of control systems that Apollo used and placed on that back shell on something like this where it's non-existent. Mm -hmm. So we're, what we're trying to do is do what the Wright brothers did for aircraft. Try to maneuver this vehicle to where we want it to go and design the systems on this existing structure, this rib structure, or on the payload in order to land, let's say, uh, a human habitat where we want it to go. Oh, yeah. We don't yeah, want okay. it to just kind of float along and then <laughs> yeah, yeah. we'll go like, okay, we guess we got to go over there. Like, guess like we'll float up here. Go That's right. Yeah. That would so, be an interesting origin story. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to like yeah. um, So what we want to do is use these existing structures that allow the vehicle to be stowed to install new kinds of control systems. Um, to guide these vehicles. Very cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Neat. It's fun to see the back side of it. We learned, we you learned about it the last side. episode. Yeah. The far side of the adept. That's right. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks so for bringing all that stuff in. We're going to move on to our question and answering session, yeah. but Sarah, don't go too far because a, uh, one of our uh, watchers wants to know, can it cover a curiosity type payload? Mm. So, uh, Yes, it can, um, but there's still design challenges. I would say this technology has the capability to grow in scale, um, to land large payloads, uh, but because it's a cutting edge technology, there's still a lot of development work to overcome some challenges that we may have. Um, and all of those challenges come with how do you package and stow everything that you need with respect to the control system to land it where you need to go. Okay. But it's possible. Pretty cool. All right, neat. Um, for Nettie, we have a comment. That's so cool. Now, I don't know <laughs> at what point that comment came in, but. It's all cool. You, yeah, yeah, exactly. You told us about a lot yeah. of cool stuff. All of NASA is cool. <laughs> and a question What is the operating temperature of the paint? Oh, interesting. Yeah, um, well, I would say uh, a nice uh, bookend would be from down to like 40 degrees F up to maybe 140 degrees F. Mm -hmm. When we start going up to higher temperatures, the, the, the paint will actually start to peel off the model. Oh, right. uh, so then we need to think about, uh, you know, what kind of paint we use, how do we apply it. Um, yeah, so there's interesting design challenges with the chemistry of the paint and actually the application of the paint. Yeah, yeah neat. Okay. And Patricia, we have a question for you. So uh, someone wants to know, is NASA currently running any quantum computers for calculations yet, and or are they not really worthwhile yet? So actually, yes, there is a quantum computer in the supercomputing division, but um, uh, they run, so it's a semi-quantum computer. It's not quite there yet, but they're still working on it. Mm -hmm. And they run, they run some simulations on predicting uh, the, the trees, like just from images, what is a tree and what is not a tree. I think there is, you can find it on the, on the website. Okay. Um, but yeah. Okay. Very Still cool. working on it. There's a question, if anybody has an answer. Has Ames ever done aerodynamics tests for a Martian atmosphere? Yeah, you know, we have a Martian wind tunnel here. Ah. <laughs> So oh, cool. Uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. We have a whole wind tunnel for it. But cool. uh, have they tested any vehicles in there? It, yes, they, they have. have. Okay, right. tested the Mars copter. So oh, yeah. okay. The Mars nice. helicopter. Okay, mm -hmm. that's another cool thing. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that someday. <laughs> Mars, we actually do have Mars here on Earth. We yeah. do. Yeah. We've talked a lot about Mars here on Earth today and yeah. for the biology yeah. and the environments. Um, let's find another one. Oh, one cool question. It's, um, let's see, what are the most exciting technological developments on the horizon for your field? 
Ooh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll hop in there. And let me tell you all about pressure sensitive things. <laughs> yeah. So, what, um, you know, what we have been doing for the past, you know, since the 1980s is this is really a steady state measurement. And um, what I would claim that we're leading here is the, um, looking at unsteady pressure sensitive paint. So, it can, instead of sensing um, a pressure over several seconds, what if we could sense it like 25,000 times a second? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're working on now. Um, you know, it's been um, proven in the labs and in small wind tunnels, um, but I, I love a good challenge and I like to call it, you know, I'm a child of the, the Tim the Toolman Taylor. The, the, <laughs> oh, 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 more power. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I you know, like we mentioned earlier, dream big. Uh, yeah. I love to dream big. So, you know, that, that model that we showed earlier was actually using pressure sensitive, the unsteady pressure sensitive paint, okay. sensing at 10,000 frames per second, 25,000 frames per second. And why that's interesting is that, um, you know, for for CFD, for wind tunnels, um, when we start talking about unsteady aerodynamics, there's a big question mark there. And that's that's probably one of the biggest feats that we're facing as like uh, NASA and even just like the aerospace community in general is like aer unsteady aero is hard to predict. And one way that we um, you know design vehicles is we just make them heavier and stronger. And that mm -hmm. will dampen out any of these um, unsteady aero um, flow physics that are happening. But um, you know, where unsteady PSP, like, why do I even care about that? Is that if we can actually measure this better and we don't just throw mass at the problem and make the, make the, you know, tail <laughs> of the aircraft stronger, make the, the heat shield around the astronauts thicker, but like, if we could actually sense it and measure it and be more accurate in our calculations of the loads, I mean, it's really crazy to think of the the possibilities. Like we could we could put more payload on. We can make the the rocket lighter. Not only that, cool. you, the control systems which take yeah. all of this mm -hmm. input. It it makes my job easier because then I all I have to do is worry about getting to the location as opposed to now accounting for all these dispersions we didn't know we couldn't yeah. we couldn't predict or I had to be really robust to a large uncertainty which puts a lot of pressure on the control systems. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fun to think. Just yeah. like imagine and dream for a moment, because yeah. we're not that far away. But you know, you have to have that vision. You have to have yep. that dream. And I think that's yeah. really what um, you know resonates with anyone here at NASA. Is like you know, dream outside the box. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Pretty cool. Cool. What about you two? What about what you guys? So for me, I'm gonna mention two things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first is that uh, we're. CFD can be useful for not just like predicting the flow or um, just the forces. So uh, Diana, she was here before. She said mm -hmm. she's working with drones and UAVs right. measuring fog. So actually, that's one of the projects I'm working on right oh. now. Uh, we're using CFD uh, to predict the ground effect of their drone when they're taking off. Oh, Ooh. really? So in order to avoid the uh, contamination of the sample, oh. uh, they want to know where to put it before taking off and landing. So oh, we're we'll running wow. simulations to, to see that. And uh, it might change their design or they it might m make it more confident. Oh, right, yeah. So, cool. Change how they do their science based yeah, on what you exactly. find. Yeah, neat. And then the other thing is uh, it's called urban air mobility. Um, mm. So it means uh, drones, but for people. So oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. it's like everyday users like the rest of us ladies yeah. here that yeah. don't get to work with drones every day at work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it means like in the city, instead of like taking your car or the bus or whatever, you could like jump on one of these drones and take it to the office. Wow. And so, well, there are many challenges on that, but the idea is to have uh, electric vehicles with multi rotors also because we want to be able to take off and land vertically. Mm -hmm. So we don't need a like a long highway. Yeah. And mm -hmm. runway, sorry. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but we also like there are challenges. So th these vehicles need to be safe uh, in order to be able to fly in the cities, right? And then mm -hmm. we also need to make them quiet. And then uh, also they, they need to be efficient because. Uh, yeah. Right now, a drone uh, can only fly for like 10, 20 minutes, and oh, yeah, yeah, and it's a small it thing. Small. <laughs> so okay, okay, you want to go bigger, and then you want to carry people, and they will have to be safe. So we're doing CFD simulations right. of these vehicles. That's, That's pretty cool. Insane. So all those challenges for urban air mobility, mm -hmm. you can work on in supercomputing, mm -hmm. and yeah. then you'll pass those on to the yes. aerospace. That's right. <laughs> yeah, folks. yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we're making, gonna make that a reality so we can fly to work. That's right. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Those are good examples. What about you, Sarah? Like, what's what's your dream big? 
for for your area of expertise? My dream big is that we are a deep space faring people. I mean, that that really is kind of where we want to go next. Um, NASA's been a pioneer on low Earth orbit. We've been a pioneer to the moon. Mm -hmm. We want to go back to the moon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, start looking at technologies that would we would need to actually go to planets farther out, uh, Mars specifically. Um, but we've got to have a testing ground. We've got to understand what it means to to do these things, um, but still be able to come back to Earth and retool and you know, so. A lot of technologies have to be enabled for us to be to go farther, right? Um, one such and shameless plug, right? <laughs> Look, Nettie, um, is entry, descent, and landing technologies like this one, um, okay. Adept. We want, you know, we want to go larger than robotic missions. We want to go larger than um, uh, s small science missions. Those kinds of things. Um, and we want to land habitats and people. And to me, if we can find that, and it's hard work. There's no simple answer. That's why no one's done it yet. No one's like completed yeah. it, right? Because we're all trying to figure out how, what is the efficient way? What is the safest way? Mm -hmm. um, how do we do this successfully? And I think what's really great is NASA and the United States is involved in this problem. I mean, yeah. it's it's. I, to be proud of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is my that's that's my <laughs> like technologies on on the forefront are really about how do we how do we go to deep space? I mean, it's it really is exciting. That is that's cool. That is really cool. I was just thinking, what about the question we wanted to ask? Do you guys have a favorite oh, yeah. spacecraft or aircraft? <laughs> yeah. Could you choose? Is that a terrible choice to force you to make? <laughs> It is a terrible choice for me to have to make because I love, well, I like aircraft and spacecraft. So the X-59 yeah. low boom flight demonstrator is one of my favorite aircraft mm -hmm. um, right now just because it is exactly what NASA does, yeah. does the work to create the next industry in our, in our yeah. country, which is really amazing. Yeah. And that's... The plan is to oh, create a supersonic sorry. plane. To yeah. create a supersonic plane that reduces the noise of the boom okay. and okay. can fly over land. And can fly over land. And yep. is open to civilians. So Ooh, exactly. it's not just a open jet to setters. Yeah. 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 And right now, my favorite is deployable entry vehicle. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So you? for me, I guess I have to say that these urban air mobility vehicles I've been working on. So um, I don't think we have a picture for it, but uh, um, it's called a side-by-side -side aircraft. So it's a concept. It's like a, looks like a helicopter, but uh, instead of one main rotor, it has two rotors. And these two rotors overlap. But they're synchronized, so like the blades don't yeah, crash mm -hmm. against each other. Huh. And this overlapping, uh, we we're, we're still working on it, but uh, it looks like uh, improves uh, the efficiency by 20% in cruise flight. Oh, okay. So nice. yeah. How oh, cool! That's such that's a really practical. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah okay. um, that's cool. Yeah, it might there might be a video soon. So <laughs> keep an eye. Keep an eye. Yeah. Okay. And what about you, Nettie? Yeah, like, what's um, your favorite? You know, I I'm like Sarah. You know, I, I we all love fluids. So anything that flies through the air, um, we're just in love with. So. That might be um, worth saying, actually, air is a fluid. Yeah, you guys, yeah, right? and, you know, right. we should have said right. that up in the beginning. Right. That, yeah, as fluid dynamicists, aerospace engineers, we consider anything that's a gas or a liquid, anything that's deformable. So okay. I always like to okay. move my hands through that's the air. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, no, you, know, <laughs> yeah, I, um, you know, my favorites happen to be the ones I've worked on. Um, okay. Yeah, and, I, you know, the, the really exciting piece of that is like, um, you know, in my career so far, I've gotten to work on the Orion space vehicle. We've applied the PSP there. Um, the SLS um, at Trust Brace Wing is one of the experimental aircraft that we are testing and um, uh, collecting a lot of data on, assessing. 
Um, and I think the really interesting part, uh, I remember when we did EM-1 of the Orion spacecraft, and I woke up early because, you know, it was launching at Kennedy, so it was like 3 o'clock in the morning here, and I woke up early, and, um, you know, I'd been here maybe uh, four years at that point, so you're just, like, shy and, and excited. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, like, magical in my heart because, you know, my fingerprint was on that oh, and yeah. yeah and it's really cool and like each one of us here have our fingerprints on something like that and i think it's a wonderful example about nasa that it's like not any one of us creates an sls or an adept mm -hmm. or a drone but it's like this community of experts across many fields including the two of y'all that like it's important to get the pr out there and do shows like this to show like this is what nasa is doing so like we have our fingerprints on that it's and it's nice because we all have a little piece of the story yeah, yeah yeah and it's all about telling our story yeah that's Pretty exciting cool. so we have some questions about your careers but a quick technical question for Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, how is it going to reduce the supersonic boom? So that would be the X-59 experimental mm -hmm. plane. Um, so the way it reduces the boom is by virtue of its geometry. Mm -hmm. So you can design the, the vehicle's geometry to create a pressure wave does, that does not have as much of a loud boom when it reaches, uh, well, when it, when it creates that shock wave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, the geometry of the plane, cool. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Right. yeah, and if and we can think of that, it was like uh, that pressure wave that we hear as the sonic boom. Like that's energy coming from the airplane and hitting our ear. So mm -hmm. if we can distribute that energy over like a longer nose, which you'll look at the, you can look at pictures of the X fifty nine and see how mm -hmm. long the nose is. Then we're not, de we're decreasing the energy that's coming to us okay. to our ear. Yeah. So we spreading it out. Yeah. yeah. So that's why it's called the low boom. Yeah. 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 It's not a no boom. boom. Yeah. There's still a boom. We have not changed <laughs> physics. Right. So we have tried. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, well, I do have a comment from the chat. They said these women are such an inspiration. Oh, you are. Really are. That's my mom. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, and I think uh, one interesting thing, like looking at the DEP model here, like since it's National STEM Day, and I'm sure there's people out there thinking about like, oh, like I want to be an engineer, but I don't know what. Uh, I think like everything that we've talked about today has been like a great example. So it's like if you like material science, like I yeah. see this woven fabric right. here, and I saw <laughs> yes. the chemistry of the paint. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, the the supercomputing no like uh, heat transfer. Um, we look at the structure here. If you like structures, if you're yep. more of a mechanical person, the whole electrical computer science field. Yeah. Um, so you know, th there's a great story about just our sharing, and then also the women that have come before us to share. Yeah. Just like this plethora of ideas, and like we all have a different background and found our love language. <laughs> <laughs> And in different areas, so there's, yep. yeah, there's, I think that's a beautiful story about NASA, that, like, there's really a flavor of every engineer here. Yeah, <laughs> yes. right. Okay, so specifically, like, if we have, you know, some of our users at home, or our viewers at home, like, what piece of advice would you give to a young student who's trying to figure out what they want to do, or what they want to mm -hmm. be? Good question. Yeah, uh, can I, I, I will say one thing, communicate. It's so important to communicate, like as we've talked, like passing data back and forth, talking to one another, uh, that's so important. So that, that's often a kind of a fluffy answer, but communicate. I also would say uh, start and don't stop. Like uh, I look at different times, like in my academic career, in my professional career, where there's just this daunting task that's like, I've never heard of pressure sensitive paint. Right. But now, you know, I claim I'm one of the world's experts in that. And so you just, you just stay, the, stay um, start and don't stop, just keep, Keep going at it. Just keep <laughs> plugging away, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, what about you, Patrice? Patricia? Um, I would say passion with excellence. So whatever you choose to do, do it with passion, and the excellence will come with it. OK. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, my piece of advice is um, never let any self-doubt or anything external to you prevent you from staying the course. And so stay the course, because uh, I know for myself, uh, math and science actually didn't come easy to me. I, I struggled with it, but when I actually learned it, it was the most amazing experience. <laughs> yeah. Every time I sat down to a math problem, even though I knew I was going to study longer or it was going to be harder, um, at the end, I was just like, oh my gosh, I figured it out. This is so cool, and now it's teaching me something. And so yeah. I, no matter what challenges I encountered throughout my life, 
um, it was really important to never let those kinds of things prevent me from staying the course. And that's yeah. what I would tell youngsters. <laughs> that's such a great piece of advice. <laughs> I think that's really inspirational to hear where it didn't come easily to people. Like, you don't maybe don't have to be a superstar in math mm -hmm. to end up working in NASA. You just got to work hard at it. Yeah. That's super cool. Or ask your sister. <laughs> <laughs> she was one year. She were one year apart, and she's always better in math than me. Mm -hmm. So I would ask her questions. Too. <laughs> well, she helped me. She helped me sometimes. That's a community. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you know what? I I think something that's really beautiful here with having all the women that we've um, had on the show is, uh, you know, there was. There's, we were talking about running when y'all showed Sunita Williams earlier, yes. and mm -hmm. you know she famously ran the Boston Marathon mm -hmm. in space. But there's uh, another marathon runner, Shalane Flanagan, and she won the New York City Marathon last year. And she had this great article uh, talking about her bringing other women into this running club. And she said, "It's not so lonely at the top if you bring others along." Oh, and right. it, uh, you know, and and that passion, um, you know talking to one another, uh, making room for more women in science, uh, technology, engineering, and math. Like We we have a responsibility to pull each other in and, and say, look what she's doing. Wow, she's amazing. Yeah. Right. You get a chance to highlight other Wonder Woman in your life. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Fabulous. OK, well, I Should think we, we have up? officially, officially <laughs> run out of time. Yeah. Darn <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and also a thank you at home for joining us. Uh, you can learn more about women at NASA by going to women.nasa.gov. And this has been NASA in Silicon Valley Live, a conversational show out of NASA's Ames Research Center with the various scientists, researchers, and engineers, and all the, all the around cool folks here at NASA, where we get to uh, talk about all the nerdy NASA news that you need to know about. And if you like that, you can find us on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and NASA TV. And if you can't catch us live, that is no big deal. Uh, we will have the video on demand after the show is over. And you can also catch the audio version of this podcast through services uh, throughout the solar system and beyond. And a huge thank you to our guests and everyone that joined us on the Twitch chat. Uh, we'll be back next week on Thursday, November 15th, where we'll talk about heat shields and how they help spacecraft survive atmospheric entry. And until that, until next time, uh, thank you for watching. Bye.